The following is a truncated version of This Week in Amateur Radio. Please visit TWIAR.net for the full version. Now in our 21st year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1130 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Federal Communications Commission opens the comment period for the proposed $50 license fee increase. The Radio Amateur Society of Australia writes to the president of the International Amateur Radio Union over the increase in QRM on 40 meters. The FCC relocates into its new headquarters. We will tell you where it is. The 2021 Hamvention Award nominations open up on November 1st. A Colorado amateur television group is actively transmitting images from the Cowwood fire. Young radio amateurs are preparing for Youth on the Air Day, while balloons carrying amateur radio are headlighting jamboree on the air for scouts in Indiana. The International Amateur Radio Union officials challenges its member societies to focus on what it calls tomorrow issues. Guidelines are issued for the upcoming ARRL DX contest multi-operator stations. We will tell you about the new requirements. And we are not making this up. NASA has awarded Nokia a multi-million dollar contract to build a 4G cellular network on the moon. No kidding. That and a little story about actress and scientist Hedy Lamarr are coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Australia's own Anil Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will take us through his recent journey building an old-fashioned crystal radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill concludes his series of amateur radio's fallen flags with a look at Swan Radio. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, takes a look at the best ways for you to seal up those coax connections for the coming winter season. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, where it's a little past peak as far as fall leaf peeping goes, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from our Catskill Mountain radio transmitter, high atop Sand Hill, where if you hurry, you may see the last leaf fall off the tree. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in historic Armory Square, downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from along the southern edge of Lake Ontario in Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we are experiencing a temperature whipsaw this week, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. 60 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off our news this week, the comment period has opened for amateur radio operators and others in the United States to weigh in on the FCC's recent proposal to charge a $50 fee for license applications and renewals every 10 years. In its notice published in the Federal Register, the FCC states that licenses, such as those for amateur radio, are mostly automated processes not requiring a staff review. As such, the FCC is calling the proposed nominal fee, saying it covers the cost of routine ULS maintenance, the automated process itself, plus any occasional instance requiring staff input. Comments are due no later than the 16th of November. Reply comments, which are comments on received comments, can be made on or before November 30th. To file your comments, visit the webpage for the FCC's electronic comment filing system at FCC.gov stroke ECFS stroke. The Radio Amateur Society of Australia wrote to the president of the International Amateur Radio Union on the 1st of October 
over the chronic interference to the 40-meter band in Region 3. The great majority of intruder stations speak Indonesian and do not identify. They operate in the bottom half of 40 meters using upper sideband, often in 10 kilohertz multiples. These stations are received continuously in Darwin, Australia, and every afternoon and evening in the remainder of the Australian continent. They are causing harmful interference to Australian amateur stations. They would also be causing harmful interference to amateur stations right across Southeast Asia, Papua New Guinea, and Micronesia. Radio Amateur Society of Australia first reported this problem to the IARU Region 3 chairman two years ago. In the intervening period, the interference has increased in severity. It appears that the popularity of digital modes around 7065 to 7075 kilohertz is forcing the illegal stations down into the CW segment below 7050 kilohertz. Radio Amateur Society of Australia again reported the issue to Region 3 IARU chairman on the 2nd of September, but have not received a reply. The Radio Amateur Society of Australia approached the Australian regulator, the ACMA, last year on the issue and asked them to conduct their own monitoring with a view to a formal complaint through the International Telecommunications Union process. Unfortunately, the Radio Amateur Society of Australia were advised that, due to staff cutbacks, the ACMA was unable to conduct the requested monitoring. In the absence of formal government regulatory action, Radio Amateur Society of Australia's view is that the IARU, as the regional umbrella organization, should take a proactive role in resolving the issue. The Radio Amateur Society of Australia suggested in their letter to the International Amateur Radio Union President that the IARU and the Indonesian National Radio Amateur Society should formulate a plan of action and offer to assist as required. A reply has not been received to date. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The Federal Communications Commission has moved, even though many amateurs probably didn't know where it was to begin with. The new FCC headquarters address is 45 L Street Northeast, Washington, D.C., 20554. The change is effective immediately. The FCC announced plans to move last spring, but the transaction was delayed by the ongoing pandemic. The Federal Communications Commission, like many federal agencies, has its own zip code, so there will be no disruption of mail delivery sent by the United States Postal Service to the former address. The FCC still prohibits the delivery of hand-carried documents and all pandemic restrictions or instructions regarding access to FCC facilities remain in place at the new location. The Commission continues to balance its efforts to be accessible to the public with a need for heightened security and health and safety measures, and encourages the use of the Commission's electronic comment filing system to facilitate the filing of applications and other documents when possible, the FCC said in an October 15th public notice. Due to the pandemic, the move was accomplished by professional movers without the presence of any employees, all of whom had been working from home. An attempt was made during the summer to let employees back into headquarters for a day to pack up their offices and remove personal belongings, but that plan had to be scrapped after several employees tested positive. Most FCC staff continue to work from home and are not expected to be physically present in their new offices before next June. In anticipation of the planned move, the FCC last spring also announced the adoption of a new FCC seal. The redesign is the product of an agency-wide contest that solicited proposals from employees and contractors. The revised design incorporates several elements, communications technologies, four stars on the outer seal border drawing from the legacy of the predecessor Federal Radio Commission seal, retaining the three-wire dipole supported by two towers, 18 stars on the shield, 
recognizing the current number of bureaus and offices, and the Eagle and Shield identifying the FCC as a federal government agency. Official use of the new seal was to begin following completion of the Commission's move from the portals to its new location on L Street Northeast. Nominations for the 2021 Hamvention Awards will open on November 1st. Hamvention will grant awards in the categories of Technical Achievement, Special Achievement, Amateur Radio Operator of the Year, and Amateur Radio Club of the Year. The Technical Achievement Award recognizes important contributions towards technical excellence in the world of radio. Examples are inventions, processes, discoveries, experiments, or any other outstanding technical achievements that contributed to amateur radio. The Special Achievement Award goes to a radio amateur who has made an outstanding contribution to the advancement of the radio art and or science. This award typically is conferred upon a respected amateur who has spearheaded a single significant project. The Amateur of the Year Award honors a radio amateur who has made a long-term commitment to the advancement of amateur radio. This individual will usually have a history of giving back to ham radio contributions and exhibits dedication to service, professionalism, and a desire to advance amateur radio. The Club of the Year recognizes a club's involvement in varied aspects of amateur radio for the greater good of the community and or the nation. These awards are conferred annually. Nominations close on February 15, 2021. Nomination forms are available. Additional information may be included as attachments. Provide a means to contact the nominee. Submit forms by email or U.S. mail to Hamvention, Attention Awards Committee, P.O. Box 964, Dayton, Ohio, 45401-0964. Award recipients and their accomplishments will be posted on the Hamvention website and in the Hamvention program. Awards will be presented on the Saturday evening of Hamvention. Since 1955, Dayton Hamvention has honored many radio amateurs and clubs for their dedication and contributions to amateur radio and to society. Radio amateurs in Colorado took advantage of amateur TV to observe recent forest fires. With more details on this unique use of amateur television, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. Boulder, Colorado amateur TV repeater W0BTV has been transmitting views of the Calwood fire. The camera is at KH6HTV southeast of Boulder and about 15 miles from the fire. With a telephoto lens, the KH6HTV camera was able to view the fire along the front range as it approached the Rocky Mountain foothills. TV images are being received at the Boulder County Amateur Radio Emergency Service Command Post located in the Boulder County Emergency Operations Center where they are displayed on a large screen monitor. The Calwood fire broke out on October 17th northwest of Boulder. By midweek the fire had consumed some 10,000 acres of forest and destroyed more than two dozen homes. The W0BTV repeater video is being streamed live over the British Amateur Television Club server in the UK. The Wright Audio Channel carries live audio from the Boulder County Amateur Radio Emergency Service 2-meter repeater with emergency net traffic. California and Oregon have been experiencing major forest fires for the past couple of months. Not much was to be seen on the ATV repeater's video image at midweek as a cold front had rolled in, bringing light rain and fog and helping to suppress the fire. The Boulder ATV Club has installed a new 5.9 GHz FM TV beacon transmitter on a government building for the purposes of encouraging microwave experimentation to get hams to try ATV, especially with low-cost FM TV gear available for drones, to use as a known signal source for testing antennas and receivers, and to increase usage of our microwave bands, which are always under threat. We are just about a month away from December, but it's worth planning ahead for this event. It involves the world's youngest radio amateurs, and they're looking for your show of support and your call in their logbook. 
December is YOTA, or Youngsters on the Air Month. It's a time that's set aside for young people to experience their first DX contact, working through their first pileup, or to show some of their friends who aren't yet licensed amateurs how much fun it is to get on the air. Youngsters on the Air are asking radio operators around the world to be listening for such stations as HA6YOTA, GB20YOTA, DB0YOTA, HS9YOTA, and others who will be using the YOTA suffix and one by one call signs ending in Y, O, T, and A from the United States. Meanwhile, Remember last week's story about the big balloon launch by students from around the United States? Well, those balloons just gained some company up in the atmosphere. Boy Scout Troop 1 in Jeffersonville, Indiana, places a special emphasis on STEM. That's science, technology, engineering, and math skills. So when the Scouts hosted their local council's Jamboree on the Air event last Saturday, they naturally had everything down to a science. In addition to making standard HF contact, fox hunting, and playing Morse code games, the Scouts launched lightweight helium balloons, each carrying a payload of no more than 13 grams. Today they're tracking them using APRS in the hopes they can follow the planned circumnavigation of the Earth in the jet stream. Using the call sign N9BWT-12, the balloons transmit their location every two minutes. The project is nothing new to this science-minded group of scouts. During last year's Jamboree on the Air event, the lightweight balloon made its way around the world one and three-quarter times before it was lost in a thunderstorm in Southern California. This story is for the fans of the Fox TV Network series Last Man Standing. Tim Allen, KK6OTD, is going QRT on the Fox Network. The American TV sitcom will begin its ninth and final season on the network early next year. The Fox Network has carried the series since May 2018, following its cancellation by ABC a year earlier. The show features Tim as amateur radio operator Mike Baxter, KA0XTT. Producer John Amadio, AA6JA, said that the cast and crew are now in the process of shooting 21 shows to begin airing in January. All is not lost, however. Even after the final season airs on Fox, the show's 194 episodes will live on in syndication. ARRL members may visit the Learning Network website to register for upcoming sessions and to view previously recorded sessions. The schedule is subject to change. How to get started in amateur radio contesting, hosted by Anthony Lucrez, K8ZT. Why do hams contest? How would I benefit from contesting? And what do I need to get started in contesting? What are good contests for beginners? Where can I learn more? Now, this session will answer all of those questions and more. The webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020 at 10 a.m. PST, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 1800 UTC. Learn and have fun with Morse Code, hosted by Howard Bernstein, WB2UZE, and Jim Kreitz, W6JIM. Morse Code, or CW, is a popular ham radio operating mode. Learning CW doesn't have to be an arduous or lonely experience. Learn, practice, and enjoy CW with the methods used by the Long Island CW Club. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, December 17th, 2020, at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, or 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. That's 0100 UTC on Friday, December 18th. The nationwide American Red Cross Emergency Communications Fall Drill, a joint exercise with ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service Groups, is set to take place on November 14th. This exercise evolved from the highly successful spring drill that attracted hundreds of participants from some 40 states and Puerto Rico. The Fall Drill will be a WinLink specific event with these goals. One, to pass traditional American Red Cross forms from as many states and as many radio amateurs as possible to one of six division clearinghouses, and two, 
bring as many radio operators as possible up to a basic level of WinLink proficiency. A series of WinLink workshops is held each Thursday at 0100 UTC on the Zoom video conferencing platform. WinLink proficiency goals have been drafted, a WinLink technical support team has been formed, and metrics for drill success have been developed. The proficiency goals are established as a training guideline and references online training resources. Many hams new to WinLink may find these resources helpful. More than 300 radio amateurs have signed up for the event, and some 100 volunteers showed up for a pre-drill briefing call earlier this month. Another briefing call will be held in early November. The event is open to all radio amateurs. For more information, contact Mike Walters, W8ZY, with Aries-related questions, or Wayne Robertson, K4WK, with Red Cross-related topics. ARRL has issued guidelines for multi-operator stations competing in the ARRL DX contest on CW and phone. With the global pandemic continuing to impose restrictions on social gatherings, multi-operator contest stations may not be able to operate normally while still adhering to local social distancing guidelines. ARRL has taken the decision to make temporary accommodations for a multi-operator station to participate as a team in these popular ARRL contests under the following guidelines. Team members may operate from their home stations in conjunction with the multi-op station. Their home station must be located within a radius of 100 kilometers, that's 62 miles, of the multi-op contest station. Their home station must be located within the same DXCC entity as the multi-op contest station. All team member stations must use the same call sign as the multi-op contest station for the duration of the contest. Logging software must be networked so that all team member stations are using a common log. Individual operators may not work the multi-op contest station or other team member stations using a personal call sign or other call sign. All multi-operator rules such as band changes and number of signals on a band still apply. See the full contest rules for details. The team must determine and control band assignments, ensuring that no more than one team station is transmitting on any given band at a time. The multi-op contest station may be staffed at less than full capacity while maintaining safe practices, so operating with a combination of team members at home stations and team members at the contest station is permissible. The CW contest takes place on the third full weekend of February. That's February 20th and 21st of 2021. The phone contest takes place on the first full weekend in March. That's March 6th and 7th, 2021. For questions, contact the ARRL Contest Branch. The Logbook of the World Committee, work WSJTX developer Joe Taylor, K1JT, to harmonize the designation of FST4 amongst WSJTX and ADIF standard and Logbook of the World. At present, FST4 is only supported in a recent released beta version of WSJTX. The committee's action was to avoid the sort of confusion that cropped up among Logbook of the World users logging contacts in FT4 when that protocol was first included in WSJTX. In the case of FST4, the committee acted proactively to help users avoid difficulties and obtain the maximum number of contact matches. The ADIF standard has been updated to support FST4 as a submode of MFSK and configuration file config.xml for Logbook of the World has been updated to version 11.13 accordingly. To support FST4, users will be offered the update when they run TQSL. Again, FST4 is only available in WSJTX, and ADIF file emitted by WSJTX should properly identify FST4 so that contacts will upload smoothly into Logbook of the World provided the config file has been updated. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air. This week in amateur radio. 
In the winter of 1960-1961, Herb Johnson, W7GRA, began producing single-band, sideband transceivers in a garage in Benson, Arizona. At that time, the only other SSB transceiver on the market was the Collins KWM2. W7GRA's company, the Swan Electronics Corporation, would provide strong competition for Collins and a low-cost method for hams to get on sideband. The first Swan transceiver, the SW120, was marketed in January 1962. It was a 130-watt PEP single-band unit operating on 20 meters. For die-hard AM operators, the SW120 could put out 25 watts of amplitude modulation. It featured 15 tubes and a price of $275. In the summer of 1962, a 40 meter version, the SW140, came out at the same price. These units were followed by the SW175 for 75 meters, the 160X for 160 meters, and the SW240, a tri band transceiver for 75, 40, and 20 meters. In 1965, the Swan 250 was introduced. This was a 6 meter transceiver featuring 240 watts PEP, 180 watts on CW, and 75 watts on AM. The price was $325. An updated version, the Swan 250C, came out in 1968. The 250C was priced at $420 and featured selectable upper sideband, lower sideband operation, an S meter, a built-in 250 kilocycle crystal calibrator and improved frequency readout. The 250 and the 250C proved to be very popular with the 6 meter crowd. They were only a few dollars more than Heathkit's 6 meter rig, the SB110, but unlike the Heathkit, they came fully assembled and featured AM operation. Swan had, of course, long outgrown that Arizona garage and Herb Johnson had relocated the company to Oceanside, California in the early 60s. In 1967, Swan was acquired by and became a wholly owned subsidiary of Cubic Corporation in San Diego, California. Herb Johnson stayed on with the company. New radios introduced after Cubic's purchase included the Swan 260, the 270, the 300B, the 350, the 400, the 500, the 700, and the 750, all five-band HF rigs. Swan also produced a set of twins, the 600T transmitter and the 600R receiver. In the early 1970s, Swan entered the new VHF FM market with a 12-channel crystal-controlled 2-meter rig. Swan faced stiff competition in the VHF FM field from the Japanese rigs and soon left that market segment. By 1973, Herb Johnson felt that it was time to move on and he left Swan. He formed a new company, Atlas, and began producing two very popular units, the Atlas 210 covering 80 through 10 meters and the Atlas 215 for 160 through 15 meters. The Atlas transceivers proved to be durable, affordable, and reliable. Unfortunately, by the end of the 70s, the Japanese HF rigs had cut into the sales figures and profit margins of both Swan and Atlas. And so, Atlas ceased production, although the corporation still existed. As for Swan, the parent company, Cubic, decided that the corporate emphasis should be on high-tech military and business electronics. And so, they retired the Swan name after producing over 82,000 transceivers. Cubic continues in operation to this day, producing location equipment for the oceanographic community, radio direction finding equipment in support of search and rescue, law enforcement and surveillance applications, and a line of HF transceivers for the aviation industry. Unlike Hammerland, Halicrafters, or National, Swan Cubic Corporation did not have to suffer the embarrassment of a bankruptcy or of going out of business. Instead, Cubic merely evolved and moved on in another direction. Although the Swan name is dormant and Cubic no longer produces ham equipment, 
There's always that possibility they may come back. As for Atlas, many hams wish that they had stayed away. In the early 90s, Atlas returned to the amateur market with a new HF transceiver. Unfortunately, this radio was plagued with production and quality control problems. Many hams put down a deposit and never got a radio. A few did receive the new Atlas and were disappointed. The resurrected company called it quits after only a few months. Maybe it's true, you can't go home again. In our next installment, we will continue to look at the fallen flags of amateur radio. Until then, this is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in amateur radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio Recently, I made a commitment to building a crystal radio. That started a fever discussion with several people who provided many helpful suggestions. This is the first time I'm building a crystal radio, and to make things interesting, I'm selecting my own components and circuit diagram. What could possibly go wrong? Crystal radios have been around for a while. Around 1894, Indian physicist Jagadish Chandra Bose was the first to use a crystal as a radio wave detector, using Galena detectors to receive microwaves. He patented this in 1901. The advice I was given sometimes feels like it harks back to 1894, with suggestions of using cat's whiskers, razor blades and any number of other techniques that create the various components to make a so-called simple crystal radio. At the other end of the scale there were suggestions to go to the local electronics store and buy a kit. The first suggestions, rebuilding historic radios from parts made of unobtainium, would mean many hours of yak shaving just to get to the point of getting the components, rather than actually building the radio. I realise that part of the experience is the journey, and I'm sure that if my current project gets me hooked, I'll look into it. But I really don't want to become that amateur who has a collection of homebrew crystal radios across the ages. Besides, I'm having a look at using my crystal radio as a front end to my software, so I want to keep sight of the radio part of what I'm doing, rather than the building part. Before you get all hot and bothered, remember amateur radio is a hobby that means different things to different people. And for me, I'm currently playing with software, and I'm attempting to learn about the electronics principles that form the basis of our hobby. As I said, the other end of the scale was to get a kit and build that. It has its appeal, but there is little in the way of learning, and the construction part of things is pretty much putting together a kit, which is something I first did when I constructed an LC meter kit a while ago, so that too doesn't really appeal to me. Now comes the bit where I tell you what I've done to date. On the physical side of things, nothing. On the thinking and learning and planning side, lots. Here's where I'm at. My current understanding of a crystal radio is that you need to detect the AM waveform from an RF frequency and pipe that into something that makes noise. Traditionally, this is done with a crystal earpiece, but I saw someone use powered computer speakers with a built-in amplifier, so I'm going to start with that as my first noise maker. I should also mention that the crystal earpiece was a source of confusion. I thought that the crystal in crystal radio was referring to that one. It's not. So. Back to where I'm at. What do I need? To start off, I cannot just connect an antenna to a speaker, since it will attempt to make sound for every known frequency. Well, at least the ones that the antenna can handle that fit within the response envelope of the speaker and its amplifier. If you want to know what that sounds like, put your finger on the input plug to some powered speakers. Don't turn up the volume too loud. You'll regret it. So step one is to make a way to only let specific frequencies through. I've previously discussed this. You might know it as a bandpass filter. You can make one using a capacitor and an inductor. If you make the capacitor variable, you can change what frequency passes. This is helpful because you don't want to be decoding more than one radio station at a time. There are plenty of designs for crystal radios that offer hand-wound inductors and homebrew capacitors, but I'm not doing this to learn how to build those. I'm doing this because I want to learn how it works. I want to use readily available components from my local electronics store. So I started with building a spreadsheet that shows what the resonant frequency is for a combination of inductors and variable capacitors. Today I learned that I also need to pay attention to how wide this is, so I'll be revisiting this. There are only two more components in my radio, a diode and another capacitor. The diode cuts off half of the information, since if you recall AM uses two sidebands that are identical. 
At that point, you have a signal that contains both the carrier and the audio signal. You need one last step. Filter out the high frequency carrier. I've talked about that too. This is a low pass filter. You can do this with a capacitor. So now we have the bare bones of a crystal radio made from four components. An inductor, a variable capacitor, a diode, and another capacitor. My next challenge is to figure out what values they have so it will allow me to listen to my local AM radio station and do it using components off the shelf from my electronics store. One thing I can tell you is that this is precisely why I signed up for this project. I don't want a ready-made radio from a kit, and I don't want to have to learn how to chop down a tree in order to make a pencil. I'll keep you posted. If you have additional reading material you'd like to suggest, feel free to get in touch. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. International Radio Union Region 1 President Don Beatty, G3BJ, urged member societies attending the virtual Region 1 General Conference on October 16th to keep an eye out for future issues affecting amateur radio and IARU Region 1, which consists of Europe, Africa, and the Mideast. In closing the six-day meeting, Beatty said he looked forward to the planned in-person workshop on the future of amateur radio set for next year and expressed the hope that the current pandemic situation would allow the event to go forward as early as possible. Beatty also challenged member societies to increase their focus on tomorrow's issues, tomorrow's people and tomorrow's technologies and tomorrow's activities and tomorrow's ways of communicating with those we represent. He also asked member societies to communicate with their younger members and take account of their views to help reshape their societies for the future. The week-long virtual assembly included discussion on papers submitted by member societies, the executive committee, and other IARU components. This resulted in some 50 recommendations to the final plenary meeting in areas of finance, HF, VHF, EMC, youth, and IARU Region 1 governance. Some 120 delegates were present for the plenary and heads of national delegations considered and voted on these recommendations, which will result in actions and policy changes in IARU Region 1. Some new appointments were made in IARU Region 1 to succeed people who are retiring from their roles. The new appointments were Dick Harms, PA2DW Chair, IARU Region 1 VHF Committee, Wolf Marr, OE1MHZ Chair, IARU Region 1 EMC Committee. Barry Lewis, G4SJH Chair, IARU Spectrum and Regulatory Liaison Committee. Philip Springer, DK6SP Chair, IARU Region 1 Youth Working Group. And Gaspar Miro, EA6AMM, IARU Region 1 Monitoring System Coordinator. BD thanks those retiring and recognized their contributions. Looking back on our first virtual general conference, delegates agreed that it was different from general conferences held in the past, BD said. Although we did not have opportunities for social interaction between delegates, we can look back on a successful and very effective meeting. We are already looking forward to our hopefully in-person workshop in Novi Sad, Serbia in 2021. Papers discussed at the conference are available for download. Police in Gloucestershire in the United Kingdom are looking for information about the assault on a ham who was operating portable last month near Cheltenham. The amateur whose name and call sign were not made public was attacked by four men who accused him of spying on them. A report in the Gloucester Echo said the ham was operating portable from Cleve Common near Cheltenham at 9.20 on the evening of September 8. The report didn't say whether the man, who was in his 50s, required medical attention. Police said the assailants had left the scene in a Land Rover. Among radio enthusiasts and scientists, the late actress Hedy Lamarr deserved her name up in lights for reasons that had nothing to do with Hollywood. An inventor with a penchant for technology, the star is credited with helping develop a patented spread spectrum frequency hopping radio signaling system used during the Second World War that has led to things we take for granted today, like GPS, Bluetooth, increased security on mobile phones, and Wi-Fi. In 1997, just three years before her death, at the age of 85, she was given the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Pioneer Award. On Monday, November 9th, which would have been her 106th birthday, 
the Echolink ROC-HAM conference server is hosting Hetty Lamar Day with a four-hour net. Four YL net controllers will be taking check-ins and celebrating her accomplishments. The net will also be accessible on the Do Drop-In conference server node 355800. For just a short while, Hetty Lamar will also be back on the screen, the small screen in this case, Organizer John DeRicke, W2JLD, said that the event will be streamed on YouTube's World Amateur Radio Day channel. It will also be heard on the Broadcastify streaming platform. What is believed to be the first ham radio contact in Japan between two unlicensed individuals took place on October 11th between experience stations 8J1YAB-1 stroke and 8J3YAA Stroke 3. Both were licensed through the Seven Call Amateur Radio Club. Today is my first amateur radio, one young girl said as she wielded the mic. Me too, the girl on the other end replied. The contact on 40 meter SSB was between Tokyo and Osaka. Licensed individuals were on both ends of the contact to serve as control operators. One operator reported there was applause at the Osaka venue. Congratulations on your first attempt and great success, Toshiaki Tsunashima, JA4DLF, tweeted. Satoshi Yamaguchi, 7M4VQJ, the president of the Seven Call Amateur Radio Club, called CQ and made initial contact with Yasuyuki Suzuki, JJ0RHL, from the sister station 8J2YAB-1 in Tokyo. The licensed supervisor of 8J3YAA-3 in Osaka was Sam Yoshida, JS3CEQ. The experience stations are licensed under special permission, allowing unlicensed people to operate the station under the supervising of a licensed amateur. The idea is to promote experience with wireless communication technology. Before the noteworthy contact, the first contact by an unlicensed operator was made with 8J1JARL, a Japan Amateur Radio League special event station hosted by the Kanto Region Society of JARL and operated by Yamaguchi Takahiko JL1USZ. Puntoshi JN1VVR remarked on Twitter, Thank you for your hard work. It is necessary and important to prepare and experiment so that unlicensed people can feel the excitement of something amazing while watching the operation. This experience station operation has just begun, and the know-how that will be accumulated for the future is important. Here's the AMSAT satellite report, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. The AMSAT Board of Directors met on October 18th following the election of board members in September, and one of their first duties was to elect officers. Robert Bankston, KE4AL of Alabama, is the new president of AMSAT to succeed Clayton Coleman, W5PFG. Bankston has served as treasurer and vice president of user services. He is a life member of both ARRL and AMSAT. Other officers were elected, and the full list can be found at amsat.org. The AMSAT board also confirmed that the annual space symposium, which was to have taken place in the Minneapolis area this year, will be there in 2021. Congratulations to Olivier F4RRO and Joe KE9AJ for completing a new distance record on AO7 Mode A. That's 10 meters down, 2 meters up. The distance was 6,879 kilometers, which works out to 4,265 miles. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Here's a subject most hams have had to deal with, on towers, on the roof, or on the ground. Waterproofing coax connections. Let's look at the four most popular products I know of. The most commonly used product I know of is called coax seal. 
This stuff is sold on small rolls, about a half an inch wide and 60 inches long. It is easy to apply to clean and dry surfaces. At the size sold, one roll does not cover much except maybe one or two small connectors. My experience with coax seal is it stands up to the elements well over a period of years and is somewhat reusable for the first months in the environment. On a commercial tower, the white strips of paper fly away nicely in a gentle breeze. Being sold on a roll, it is easy to secure several to a climbing belt like rolls of electrical tape. In a tool bag, it tends to get squished into shapes that make it hard to use. Another method of protecting connections is with liquid electrical tape. This stuff is commonly sold in small, four ounce cans at the hardware store. These small cans are similar to those used for PVC cement and include a brush. This substance is similar to a solvent dissolved polymer, perhaps even rubber. Since it is kept in a liquid state with solvents, which evaporate when it applied or when the can is left open, you probably don't want to smoke while the can is open. After application with this product, the protective layer tends to be much thinner than with the wrap type sealer. This does make an excellent underlayer when using a wrap on sealer. For ground level connections where repeated layers can be added, this stuff is both easy to use and a good value. Liquid electrical tape probably cannot be applied over coax seal, but it can be applied onto less than perfect surfaces. But again, clean and dry is best. According to the label, multiple layers can be added if you allow the stuff to set for about five minutes. Since it is sold in the can, it rides along in the tool bag, but is easily dropped. Although I've only seen one, this one used a couple of times, some people still use electrical tape to seal coax connections. I do not recommend using electrical tape unless it is used as a cover over one of the wraps or brush on sealers. Problem with electrical tape is it ages poorly when exposed to sunlight, moisture, heat, and more. It tends to start to unwrap over time, crack, or get brittle. When you've installed as many antennas as I have, you've probably read some mention of how thickly you can cover a connection before you mess up that antenna's ability to shed rainwater. So the bottom line on, on electrical tape is I will not recommend using it as a primary protective layer. The fourth method I know of is similar to coax seal on rolls. Some commercial climbers use insulation wrap for automotive air conditioner systems. There are lots of brands available, so you'll have to go to several auto parts stores to hunt for the really good stuff. This wrap is much wider and thicker than coax seal and comes on a roll just like coax seal. This is made to be wrapped on metal tubes coming in and out of automotive air conditioner compressors to reduce dripping of water, improve efficiency, and protect from the elements. And since it is made to stand up to the elements and is also cost effective, the only startup cost for you is doing the research and finding a brand and a supplier. There are lots of different kinds, so look for the one most like coax seal and test it on your own before using it on someone else's antenna. Oh yeah, there is one more similar to coax seal. It is sold in a toothpaste type tube. I've never used any, so I can't comment on how it holds up to Mother Nature or how it is to use. If anyone out there knows how the sealant in the tube works, or a brand name of the automotive air conditioner wrap that is ideal for tower work, please email me your information. And my email is at the end of this segment. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. This is W2XBS with the propagation forecast for Friday, October 23rd. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspots appeared every day of the past reporting week. Compared to the previous seven days, the average daily sunspot number increased from 13.1 to 15. Average daily solar flux rose from 73.1 to 74.5, and geomagnetic indicators were up slightly, with the average daily planetary A index rising from 2.7 to 5, and middle latitude A indexes going from 1.9 to 4.1. 
Predicted solar flux for the next 45 days is 75 on October 23rd to the 27th, 72 on October 28th, 70 on November 1st to the 7th, 73 on November 8th to the 10th, 72 on November 11th, 71 on November 12th to the 13th, 70 on November 14th to the 23rd, and 72 on November 24th to the 27th. Predicted planetary A indices is 18 and 20 on October 23rd, 15 on October 24th to 26th, 12 on October 27th, 10 on October 28th, and 8 on October 29th. For more information concerning radio propagation, visit the AWRL Technical Information Service and read what the numbers mean, and you can check out K9LA's propagation page as well. WSJTX co-developer Joe Taylor, K1JT, recently expressed puzzlement over the use of FT8 in contests rather than FT4, which was designed for contesting. I fail to understand why anyone who uses FT8 in a contest would fail to use FT4 for much of the time, Taylor said. FT4 is about 3 dB less sensitive than FT8, but it's twice as fast. Taylor offered the comment in the Mount Airy VHF Society's October 2020 Cheese Bits regarding the September ARRL VHF contest. Taylor said a large fraction of stations that are worked with FT8 are much more than 3 dB above the FT4 decoding threshold. With FT4, you can still work anyone that can be worked with CW and near the CW threshold. You'll do it faster using FT4, he said. And with FT4, you can work stations that are far weaker by 20 dB than what's necessary for SSB. When I did work other stations with FT4, I did it by transmitting the FT8 message K1JT FT4 318. Taylor said that he'd then move to 50.318 MHz FT4, and several contesters followed him there. Many more would have made it much more fruitful, he said. For speed, flexibility, and ease of running the bands, yes, you should use SSB and CW when there are stations to work, Taylor said in summary. When you run out of those, use FT8 and especially FT4. Taylor also remarked, in my 80th year, I can no longer call on my past stamina for contesting. You're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio on Finer Repeater Systems Nationwide. Robert Bankston, KE4AL of Dotham, Alabama, is the new president of AMSAT. The AMSAT Board of Directors elected Bankston at its annual meeting on October 18th to succeed Clayton Coleman, W5PFG. Bankston also served as treasurer and vice president of user services. He's a life member of both the AWRL and AMSAT. He volunteered to develop and launch AMSAT's online member portal and chaired the 2018 AMSAT Space Symposium. For his part, Coleman said that it had been both a joy and a privilege to serve as AMSAT president during 2020, which he called a rather difficult year for many in amateur radio. With the talented and capable individuals sitting on AMSAT's new board and as officers, I am confident in a bright future ahead of AMSAT and the Amateur Radio Satellite Service. Other officers elected include Paul Stetzer, the N8HM, as Executive Vice President, Jerry Buxton, N0JY, as Vice President of Engineering, Drew Glassbrenner, K04MA, as Vice President of Operations, Jeff Davis, KE9V, as Secretary, Steve Belter, N9IP, as Treasurer, Martha Saragovitz as manager, Alan Johnston, KU2Y, as vice president of educational relations, and Frank Karnikos, N1UW, as vice president of development. The recent beta release WSJTX version 2.3.0 release candidate 1 digital software suite includes two new protocols, FST4 and FST4W. FST4 is for two-way contacts, while FST4W is for quasi-beacon-style transmissions. Both modes offer a range of options for TR sequence lengths and threshold decoding sensitivities extending well into the minus 40 dB range, developers said, as well as a wide variety of parameters that can be tweaked, such as transmission time, bandwidth, and so forth. 
On the WSJTX development reflector, Paul Kelly, N1BUG, discussed whether the wide variety of options are really necessary or a stumbling block to two uncoordinated stations attempting a contact. Kelly said he understands the concern regarding the transmission times, but as a very active 2200-meter operator, he advises that the new protocols were developed with the LF and MF bands in mind. LF and MF are not HF, Kelly said. There is no one-size-fits-all for these bands. On HF, you may be able to work the whole world with one relatively fast speed. It is not so down here. Kelly pointed out that MF operators are limited to 5 watts EIRP on 630 meters and a mere 1 watt EIRP on 2200 meters. Working Real DX requires some specialized modes, plus determination and patience. One would probably not want to use anything slower than 120 seconds for QSOs with well-equipped stations at 1,000 kilometers or 620 miles distance, he said. It would be very boring and waste a lot of time. But for some DX paths on 2,200 meters, only 1,800 or 900 second periods would offer any hope for success. It's not so boring when you are about to set a new world record or make a personal best DXQSO. We need this flexibility. Kelly predicts that some new conventions will emerge over time. For example, 900 and 1800 second periods might not seem much use on 630 meters, while most of the faster choices probably will. On 2200 meters, I think all four FST4W speeds will be quite useful, he said. It may be that the fastest FST4 options won't see a lot of use on 2200 meters, but it may be too early to know for sure. And finally this week, soon astronauts on the moon missions won't have any excuse for not answering their texts. NASA has awarded Nokia of America... $14.1 million to deploy a cellular network on the moon. Nokia's plan is to build a 4G LTE network and eventually transition to 5G. The system could support lunar surface communications at greater distances, increase speeds, and provide more reliability than current standards, the announcement also read. The company intends for the network to support wireless operation of lunar rovers and navigation as well as streaming video. The network is built to be compact and efficient, as well as specially designed to withstand the extreme temperature, radiation, and vacuum conditions of space. Inspired by terrestrial technology, Nokia proposes to deploy the first LTE 4G communication system in space, a blog post about this year's tipping point reads. The system could support lunar surface communications at greater distances and provide more reliability than current standards. This means your astronaut partner can no longer use being on the moon as an excuse to leave you unread. Typical astronauts, beyond that, this cellular network will be constructed in such a way that an eventual transition to 5G, which we're only just now seeing become more widely available here on Earth, can happen. This 4G LTE network will allow for a more sustainable human presence on the lunar surface. Working with our partners at Intuitive Machines, this groundbreaking network would be the critical communication fabric for data transmission applications, including the control of lunar rovers, real-time navigation over lunar geography, and the streaming of high-definition video, a Nokia Bell Labs tweet about the $14 million award reads. The mission critical LTD network that we have developed has been specially designed to withstand the extreme temperature, radiation, and vacuum conditions of space, as well as a sizable vibrational impact during launch and landing. According to UPI, NASA said a live broadcast of the announcement that the network would extend to spacecraft and help develop technology fit for the moon. While there aren't details about the timeline of this project becoming a reality, it's all in support of NASA's goal of having a lunar base on the moon by 2028. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine said in the broadcast, after all, how else would the astronauts be able to Instagram their moonwalks?
This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, W2GBO, on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's Capital Region. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved. You've just listened to a truncated version of This Week in Amateur Radio. Please visit TWIAR.net for the full version.